Welcome to Conversations on Healthcare. This week, we welcome Dr. Maria Van Kerkhove, COVID-19 technical lead at the World Health Organization, on the pandemic's latest threats. Now, here are your hosts, Mark Maselli and Margaret Flinter. January 20 is an ominous health anniversary. It's the date of the first official COVID case reported in the U.S. That milestone was three years ago, and all of our lives have been updated uh, and upended since then. Uh, At the center of the storm is the World Health Organization. It's a United Nations agency with a budget over $8 billion a year. Here to give us the latest detail is Maria Van Kerkhove. She's the World Health Organization technical lead for COVID-19 response, and she joins us from the headquarters in Geneva, Switzerland. Well, welcome back Happy to Conversation. Happy to be here. And we're, we're glad you're you're back with us. And, uh, uh, you know, we know WHO and others are tracking over 500 Omicron sublineages and that the XBB.1.5 is the one that's increasing the fastest in our country. It makes up over 80% of all U.S. cases, and that's probably changed uh, since the last reporting. And you said it's the most transmissible subvariant the scientists have detected so far. Can you tell our audience what your current read on the situation is and the threat to public health? So first of all, happy new year and thanks so much for having me back. It's been a while since I've seen you and it's really a pleasure, really a pleasure to join you. So, and I love these opportunities to have these kinds of discussions. So thanks so much. Um, The subvariant that you mentioned, this XBB.1.5 is one of more than 500 sub lineages of Omicron that we're tracking. We meaning WHO and the global community. Um, This subvariant is actually a recombinant um, of two BA.2 sublineages, you would have heard of XBB, um, which caused some outbreaks in a few countries around the world. And this is a further evolved variant of mm-hmm. that one. Um, it is detected in about 38 countries, but so far there are around 5,000 sequences that are available globally. Most of the sequences are available from the U.S. And as you noted, um, there, is, there are some estimates of how much XBB.1.5 is circulating in the U.S. U.S. CDC has revised their estimates recently, actually downward. Um, it was around 40.5% a few weeks ago. It went down to 27%, and I'm not sure if it will be even further going down. However, in the northeast part of the U.S., it's, it's more than 70% of the sequences there. So we have very little data to assess this subvariant, but all of these variants, we look at several things. One is transmissibility. And this subvariant has a growth advantage. And we look at transmissibility by growth advantage. We look at the properties of the mutations themselves. Um, This one has mutations in it that allow the virus to adhere to the cell and replicate very efficiently. Um, But it also has properties of immune escape, which is similar to XPV, which is similar to all of the Omicron subvariants. We do not have any data on severity yet, um, and we don't. We can't say if it's more or less severe compared to the other Omicron subvariants. But we don't have an indication that it's more severe, and it doesn't have any of the mutations that are known to confer more severe disease. So we recently published a risk assessment um, on this online uh, with support from our technical advisory for virus evolution. We'll update that um, as more information becomes available, but. I just want to put this in context. This is one of many sublineages that are circulating. And I think the world is really kind of fascinated by each of these sublineages that are reported and detected. But for the everyone that's out there, what is important that they need to know is that all of these sublineages behave very similarly. They're incredibly transmissible. Mm-hmm. Um, they have properties of immune escape, which means you will get reinfected. We're in the fourth year of this pandemic, which I can't believe I'm even saying. Mm -hmm. Um, And people have been infected, they've been vaccinated, but there's been a certain amount of time from their last boost. And immunity over time wanes for infection, stays pretty robust for severe disease, you know, protecting against severe disease, but people will get reinfected, but our vaccines continue to work. So what is important for the viewer out there is especially if you're in an at-risk group, make sure you're vaccinated and not just when you got your last dose, not that not that you just got a dose, but when was your last dose? Because it really matters, particularly if you're in a vulnerable group, to get that boost four to six months after you've had your last dose. So it's still out there. I mean, to, to me, this just illustrates once again that the virus continues to evolve. 
It is not settled into a predictable pattern. We as a global community and scientists around the world need to remain vigilant to track and assess these. But everyone that's out there really just needs to know, what do I need to do? What do I need to do to keep me and my family safe? Mm-hmm. Well, Dr. Van Kirkhoff, uh, as a scientist, I think you've given some key messages uh, for people to take away from that high transmissibility uh, immune escape. I think maybe we'll add that to the list of phrases people get very familiar with throughout the course of this pandemic and the need to get vaccines. So thank you uh, so much for that. I want to uh, uh, ask you a little bit about your thoughts uh, on China's uh, behavior uh, throughout COVID. Of course, it's it's been somewhat troubling, but you spent time in China early in the pandemic to get a good feel uh, for how they were dealing with the outbreak. And now they've ended the COVID zero policy uh, that really characterized their response. And we're certainly reading of uh, unofficial death estimates that are astounding. Uh, you've noted that they're not sharing sequencing or data uh, on their experience. What, what's your assessment of what's really going on there? So you're right. I did spend some time there early on in the pandemic, and I was really impressed by the level of information, the level of data, the level of analytics that they are capable of at subnational levels. You know, the sit reps that they were able to produce um, by local China CDC offices was really quite incredible in terms of their grasp of their understanding of the unfolding situation. Um, Right now, they're going through a massive wave of Omicron right now, lifting of those measures. This virus, as transmissible as it is, is passing through the population. And we are working directly with them. They are sharing information. It's just not enough. It's just not as detailed as we would like. Mm -hmm. Um, We've specifically asked for, we've had several um, direct calls. Uh, We call them three-level calls, where we have three levels of our organization at headquarters, regional office, country office, directly with our counterparts in in China to discuss transmission dynamics. What's happening? Has it peaked um, in in certain parts of the uh, certain parts of the country? Um, to show us that epidemiologic analysis, to look at the trends, to look at the the dynamics, urban, rural, different. It, China's huge, even in terms of climatic zones. Um, but more importantly, looking at the hospitalization. We need detailed information about hospitalizations around the country, the proportion of patients requiring ICU. They have presented to us the their program of response in terms of clinical care capacity, beds, um, access to therapeutics and use of those therapeutics. So that is reassuring to us that they are looking at this comprehensively and really focusing on their population, increasing vaccination coverage, targeting, uh, boosting at-risk groups. And that is encouraging. That is very helpful. But we really need better understanding on the burden and the hospitalizations. And we need more information on the sequences. So the, we had members of China CDC join our technical advisory group for virus evolution, tag VE, um, last week, um, where they presented an overview of what is circulating in the country. Um, the challenge for that is, is they have detected known subvariants, mainly the BA.5 sublineages, but we need those sequences to be shared publicly because there's a handful of people around the world that really can look at this mutation by mutation and they work with us and we want China to work with us to really determine within those BA.5.2 sublineages, those other BA.5 sublineages, is there anything else that is within those sequences that's different? And we need a global community to look at that. So we've asked them to share more sequences publicly with GISAID, a platform like GISAID, and also to work directly with us to do a risk, to do a full risk assessment, as well as to um, generate what are known as these phylogenetic trees to look at the molecular epidemiology and to see how these viruses differ and how they diverge within the country and if there's anything that's different. So there is more information that needs to be shared. Communication channels are open um, and the dialogue is good. We just need more detail. So we're working directly with them. They participate in our technical um, groups. We have clinical management calls. We have other types of expert groups and we've invited them to participate and they join. Um, We just need a bit more information from them. Well, I think it's that anxiety that people feel that they're not getting enough information. I think some of the uh, 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 channels have resorted to uh, using the uh, satellite images of crematoriums and the uh, uh, large increase that they're seeing there. And that's led mm-hmm. several countries, including the U.S., uh, to issue testing mandates for people traveling from China. And there's been a pushback uh, to these measures. We just heard from a former longtime CDC leader, Dr. Richard Besser, 
that uh, he did not think it would really help because COVID and, uh, and the subvariants are already in this country and they're uh, also around the, the globe. What's WHO's position and what should countries do? I mean, the, the virus really is everywhere. Um, you know, we have millions of cases that are reported every week. Um, between 10 and 14,000 people die every week from COVID. That doesn't make the news anymore. And it's just an astounding number. Um, the circulation of the different variants, in terms of which ones are where, it varies. There isn't one specific one that's dominant worldwide, but the virus is everywhere. Um, I think the measures that countries have put in place have put them in place because they didn't know, because they weren't getting the information out of China that they would like to see. We always advise countries to do to take a risk assessment, risk-based approach, and to ensure that the measures that they do put in place are um, are, mes are masking, are reaching that risk and, and taking into account that risk, but that they're time bound. Um, I think what people need to do everywhere, we you know, and a lot of people are focused on China right now, as they should, um, because it's so acute right now. But we as WHO are not getting data from most countries around the world in terms of what we need to assess the impact of COVID going forward. We're in a completely different situation than we were three years ago. Mm. We will see cases and we will see um, waves of infection, but the impact, the resulting hospitalizations and deaths has been declining over time. And that's fantastic because we have diagnostics, patients are getting into the clinical care pathway early. We have antivirals for early in, in disease. We have many therapeutics focusing on severe disease and we have vaccines. So what people need to know is that as they live their lives and people are living their lives to do it as safely as possible, think a little bit about what you're doing every day. Keep that mask with you. Wear a mask when you're with around others, and especially when you're indoors or you don't know where the ventilation, if the ventilation is any good when you're on public transportation, get vaccinated and look out for your loved ones who are in an at-risk group. Make sure that they get the care that they need. There's so many tools that exist. I mean, of the global challenges that we face right now, COVID has solutions. And three, four years in now, we've got flu, RSV, mm -hmm. strep A, mpox, Ebola, cholera. You know, there's so many other things that are happening. We have to deal with COVID in the context of everything else. So it's about calibrating the response going forward. But as individuals, Individuals should be empowered with the knowledge about what is around them. What is my risk? What do I do? What do I do to, to go to work and to get my kids to school um, and live your life and not be not live life in fear? Know that there's a lot that you can do to keep you and your and your kids and your parents and your grandparents safe. Well, that's so interesting. I, I really appreciate your sharing that. Uh, with our audience, I, I was thinking, as you said it, I really have developed my automatic risk assessment as I opened the door to a restaurant or to a store or to an event, that risk assessment with your mask ever at the ready. So don't know how widespread that is, but I, I think you've uh, articulated that really well. So thank you. I, I, I do want to go back uh, to this uh, uh, situation in China a little bit, but really it's a, a question for the world. Um, experts, uh, including our, our friend and now retired Dr. Fauci, uh, have, have noted the Chinese vaccines as being less effective uh, than the Western uh, developed ones. What role do you think that is playing in the current problems in China? And of course, it leads to the question of what more can the world community do for effective vaccine and treatment development? Yeah, I, and I think that's a good point. I mean, there are many, many safe and effective vaccines that are used around the world, and some are of you know are more um, effective than others. The data that we have seen on, on the Chinese vaccines that are being used, and there are several that are in use right now, and they're introducing more more as we speak. Um, when you boost with them, the population, the immunity really increases, I think, and protects against severe disease and death. So what is really critical within the population of China, 1.4 billion people, is that everyone over the age of 60, anyone who is immunocompromised really needs that third and that fourth dose. Mm -hmm. And that's what they're focused on right now, because that boost really kicks up that, that immunity uh, level. I think the challenge in China is that because they have had this dynamic zero, this zero COVID policy, there was no um, population level immunity increasing because of infection. 
And so many parts of the world um, that didn't have access to vaccine have had immunity increase because of infection and several waves of infection. Remember, this is the fifth variant of concern. And we've had many waves over these three years. Um, the vaccine uh, use in China was really how that population level immunity was increasing. Now that's changing. Now they have more of this hybrid immunity because they've had this massive wave of Omicron. Um, and if you remember a year ago, try to think back when Omicron was first detected and what we saw around the world. At WHO, when we were drawing our epi curves, we had to recalibrate the scale because at the peak, we had 23 million, I think it was 23 million cases reported in one week. And we knew that that was a gross underestimate of what was actually circulating. Now it's around five, six, no, sorry, it's around maybe two to three million reported to us. And that's in the backdrop of a significant decline in, in sampling and testing. So they're going through what con most countries went through about a year ago, but they didn't have that population level immunity from infection and or vaccination. And I think that's the challenge. That's what the focus is now. Make sure those vaccines that are in country are targeting the at risk. And we've offered, and many countries have offered to um, add additional mRNA vaccines into their portfolio. Um, and it's a matter of them willing to accept them and to use them. But the, the global community is there to support. I think, you know, we hear a lot about the politics and the fights and the, and the arguments, but the global solidarity, you know, from public health professionals, from scientists, I think you know this firsthand, doesn't matter who is in power, who is in authority, what geopolitics are at play, we're here for each other. And I think that's the real human spirit mm -hmm. and the real solidarity of this, which to me has helped get me through these last three years. You know, I want to pull pull the thread on two things that you said. One, uh, the sort of the, it's not just China where you're not getting information, places like Brazil, even parts of the United States, uh, uh, which makes this forecasting a challenge. And yet, on the other hand, you have partnerships with scientists in all these countries. And I think in your own words, a WHO superpower. But tell yes. me, is there a disconnect between governments and the maybe the private scientists that you're having a relationship with, right? Or is there are, are is everybody in sync here? I think on a scientific level, on a public health level, I feel that we are in sync. Um, during this pandemic, we as WHO have had the opportunity to to reach out to so many more technical disciplines, so many more scientists and countries because everybody went virtual. Now, of course, it matters if you have an internet connection that you can you can link up, but our reach and our listening ability has really grown. And I do think it is a superpower of ours. You know, people want to work with us because they want to contribute. I really wholeheartedly believe that. I think there is a challenge between the scientific and public health world and the political world mm -hmm. because there are different factors at play. You know, we come to this looking at, at from a scientific and a public health point of view, but we also have changed our view in saying that it's not, a, it's never only a health issue. It's an economic issue. It's a political issue. You need people that are in power that will stay in power. You need the, the economies to be able to rebound. You need the financing to deal with this. Most of the financing for COVID was pulled from somewhere else. And now governments are saying, we don't have the fiscal space anymore. It's contracting over time. And what we're trying to do is work with governments to ensure that the threat assessment is accurate, that it's realistic. We can't just stick our head in the sand and say, no one wants to talk about COVID, so we're not going to talk about COVID anymore. In fact, I would love to not talk about COVID. So maybe you can invite <laughs> me back sometime when I don't have to talk about COVID. We will. But we have to deal with this because COVID is here to stay, but we can manage it. And we have to manage it from a health point of view in our more longer, stronger, sustained health systems, not as standalone. We need the financing to support our workforce and our health systems. And we need the political backing you know, to be able to say this is a priority in the context of everything else, not at the expense of everything else. And that's the shift we're in. I think we're in a long, messy transition. Mm -hmm. You know, everybody's just like, okay, when are we done with the pandemic? Make it endemic. Let's move on. But I think this transition phase of getting to longer term respiratory disease management will take a little bit more time, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. Well, I think uh, that question of the transition, I think, is on everybody's minds and uh, the World Health 
Organization Director General recently predicted 2023 would be the year that COVID would no longer be deemed a public health emergency. But here in the US, uh, President Biden just extended the emergency order uh, for our country. So I guess I would ask you, do you think we are on track in 2023 to see an end to this as public health emergency and moving to that management phase or mm -hmm based on what you're seeing in this first month of the year, are we likely to be into this for a longer period? I know that's a little bit of crystal ball gazing versus yeah. uh, scientific analysis, but what's your thought? It is a bit crystal ball and, it, and it's very difficult to predict, you know, with certainty. So, I mean, the short answer is I don't know, but I think we can. I really do believe that we can um, end this emergency everywhere because we have the tools to do so. They exist. They exist at the right supply. We're just not utilizing them most effectively around the world. I mean, 30% of the world still has not received a, a single vaccine. You know, we're doing better at trying to reach the targets of 100% of our health workers around the world, 100% of our at-risk populations, but we're not there yet. In every country in the world, including in the U.S., we're missing key demographics in terms of that. And we have to deal with access and reach. We have to deal with misinformation and disinformation, which is absolutely rampant. Um, and I would argue somewhat getting worse uh, at the moment. Trust has been eroded over time. And, you know, it's so hard won and so easily lost. So we have to keep up that dialogue. But I am really hopeful. Um, and this is a scientific hopeful. This is, <laughs> we can do this. I, no, I really believe it because we have the tools that exist. If we didn't have a vaccine, you know, mm -hmm. if, it, if we had vaccines that were 50% effective at preventing severe disease, I would love to see new inhaled vaccines that could focus on preventing transmission. Mm -hmm. That would be a game changer. We have therapeutics that are, um, some of them are cheap to produce. Others need to be a lot cheaper, need to be more accessible, but they cover the full spectrum of disease from the antivirals early on all the way through corticosteroids. You know, these, these, it's, it's possible we need better personal protective equipment for people around the world made for women because most women are most health workers are are women um we just have to kind of keep it up the thing that scares me the most is the complacency mm -hmm. and the and the sheer fatigue and trauma we've gone through because i think the entire world has gone through something quite incredible we have not even begun to mourn the loss of millions, tens of millions of people. Um, and I think that that's something that we're going to have to deal with the mental health aspects, aspects of this going forward. Long COVID, post COVID condition is going to be with us for some time. We have to focus and research that. But I am hopeful with, that we can do this. We have to collectively put our efforts um, together to do that. And that's well, also in the context of war and other absolutely. crises and other conflicts. L let me just ask a, a question about um trust in treaties, if you will. One, you sort of made the point that it's uh, hard to win people's trust, uh, easy to lose it. We seem to have lost it. I'd love to know what your message is to uh, individuals who have basically said, I um, believe in all of the other information that's coming out. To How do we move them? Because what we're doing now hasn't moved them. And then the issue of treaties, uh, government to government. So this is about uh, individual to individual, about the trust side, but the treaty side about uh, of how governments work with each other. And you all have launched an initiative around uh, may, maybe laying a groundwork around treaties. But if you could talk about mm -hmm. both the individual trust and then maybe the trust uh, that happens uh, uh, amongst governments in terms of laying out a strategy uh, for moving forward. I think in the individual trust, um, I think those who are really who don't trust government, who don't trust scientists, who believe in the conspiracy, which are incredibly persuasive, um, that's out there. I don't know. I wonder how many of them will be watching this, because I think what we need to do is reach individuals and listen to individuals in different types of ways. Um, in different types of fora, under with different types of channels, with different types of engagement. Um, and I think for me, we've worked really hard to work with communities, listen to communities, faith-based leaders, leaders, youth leaders, mm -hmm. um, any leaders in communities to understand, first and foremost, to understand where it's where it's coming from. 
Is it a misunderstanding? Is it is it uh, that they don't know how something was produced? The vaccines were produced so quickly, so perhaps you skip some steps. I mean, some of these are questions that can be answered, and there are others that are will be very difficult. Yeah. Um, I think this is something we, as an organization, you know, fighting this infodemic, um, dealing with with misinformation and worse disinformation, is something that we're really going to have to tackle and come up with innovative ways to do so going forward. The treaty to me um, is a promise, our promises by governments to each other, to their people, to the world. And to me, I find it quite inspiring that these discussions are happening. I'm not involved in the day-to-day discussions of those and we have some amazingly dedicated people who are and it's complicated and I know that. But to me, that treaty or accord or whatever it's called is a Mm -hmm. promise. We owe it to our people, whether you're a government leader or not, to do better the next time. It didn't have to be this way. Mm -hmm. And and I really dislike saying that, but it didn't. We didn't need to have this level of death and devastation, but we're dealing with it and we are doing our best to minimize the impact going forward. Well, Dr. Van Kerkhoff, thank you for your work uh, and the World Health Organization for its dedication to promoting health and public health. Uh, and keeping the world safe. And thank you to our audience for being here. You can learn more about conversations on healthcare and sign up for our email updates at chcradio.com. Dr. Van Kerkhoff, thank you again so much and best of luck. My pleasure. Thanks for having me and happy new year. Happy new year to you as well. 